giant what? There's a giant that might come up. No idea. It's New York, and any given day you can't explain half of the things that are going on. So I don't even try. I don't like the color. I just don't like violet. I mean, I luckily NYU doesn't play in Division One, but can you imagine when NYU violet played the Michigan Wolverines? You've already lost the game, right? How did the violets beat the Wolverines? So, come on, you could, have, you could have picked a better symbol than violets. Okay, folks, a uh, couple, couple of things. One is in case you haven't picked up your quiz, it's upstairs waiting for you. And if you don't want it, I really don't want it either. So one of, you know, it's an unwanted quiz that will get tossed. I brought your first quiz in because legally I'm supposed to hold on to your damn stuff for like a year. I break the law all the time and I plan to break the law. As soon as this class is over, I'm dumping everything in the recycling. I'm heading out of here. So if you want your quizzes, pick them up. Otherwise, you just hang out there. So today we're going to actually put intrinsic valuation to rest and start on price. So today's start of the class test, I'm going to hit you with a couple of questions about pricing. Now, one of the things I'm gonna to argue today is there's nothing wrong with pricing. People do it all the time, but what troubles me is how lazy it is and the reasons given for why equity research analysts do pricing. So let's start with your discounted cash flow evaluation. Now, how many of you have actually turned in your DCF for feedback? Okay. So many of you did. And if you haven't, again, as I said, the window stays open, not all the way through May 8th. I mean, that might be a little too late, but no, at least for another four or five days, I'll keep returning the DCFs that you send it. But did you make a lot of assumptions when you value your company? Yeah, absolutely, right? Cash flows, growth, risk. Did that make you uncomfortable? It should. Why? Because you're trying to make judgments about things you don't control. And there are some people who use that as the excuse to saying, I don't do discounted cash flow valuation because I don't like to make assumptions. I'm going to use a PE ratio instead or an EV to sales. So let me start with that. Is it true that when you use a multiple like PE ratio or EV to sales, you're not making assumptions about cash flows growth risk? Is it true? Let's take an example. No? Let's suppose I take a stock that trades at 12 times earnings. The average PE for the sector is 20. And I put a buy recommendation on the stock. Am I implicitly making assumptions about cash flows, growth, and risk about this company when I make that statement that it's cheap? Or what am I assuming? That it's cash flows, growth, and risk are very similar to the cash flows, growth, and risk of the sector, right? Then I can compare the PE ratio for this company to the average and say it looks cheap. Let's face it, when you buy a stock at a PE ratio, whether you like it or not, you're making assumptions. The difference is your assumptions are implicit. You know what the danger of the implicit assumptions are? If you don't know what your assumptions are, how the heck do you know when you're making really bad assumptions? So one of the things we're going to talk about today is making implicit assumptions explicit. When you pay 50 times earnings or 10 times revenues or three times book value, we're going to back out from what you pay, what you're assuming about the future. And then I'm going to ask you, are you okay with that? Is that, is that what you think is going to happen to your company? So let's get this process started by first mopping up the last few pieces of intrinsic valuation. So I think we were on page 354. So here are the last few pieces. I want to talk a little bit about valuing companies with intangible assets. And many of you are, right? What do I mean intangible assets? Be a pharmaceutical company, a technology company, a ride-sharing company, valuing Airbnb. Let's look at the challenges you face when you value a company with intangible assets. First is none of the accounting makes sense, right? Because they've taken the biggest capex and made it into an operating expense. So the earnings are meaningless. The return on capital is meaningless. Every number is skewed. So when I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? You're already in trouble, right? You don't even know how much of the earnings are from current assets, how much is coming from having to create future growth. 
value of growth, they gain your loss because if you don't know what you've actually invested in this business, how the heck do you know what they're earning more than your cost of capital or less than your cost of capital? Even on risk dimensions, all the traditional metrics start to break down. The problem in valuing intangible assets is the accounting is inconsistent. Because you've taken your biggest capex and made an operating expense, your earnings are going to be misstated, your invested capital is misstated, your return on capital is misstated, which is part of the reason we spend so much time cleaning up after accountants, by capitalizing R&D, capitalizing some advertising expense, capitalizing customer acquisition costs. Now, the other thing to keep in mind when you, when you do this is everything about a company will change. So I'm going to take an example. Amgen, largest biotech company in the world, from about a decade ago. I'd value the company. And I went through the process of capitalizing R&D. Painful, right? Because you have to look back in time and you've got to clean up. But, but the bottom line is when I capitalize R&D and I used a 10-year life, why am I using such a long life for a pharmaceutical company? What's the rationale for it? I mean, pharma companies are the companies that I use the longest life for. Why with pharma companies does it take so long between R&D and a commercial product emerging? You got to go through three stages of the FDA approval process. Not everything flies through like COVID vaccines, right? I mean, that wasn't a special path. Usually it takes years and years and years of testing, which means it could take, but the time you do research a commercial product can take 10 years, which means I go back 10 years, I capitalize it. Here's the bottom line. When I capitalize R&D, here's what happened to my numbers. So I'm going to go item by item. So the first, second column, you see what the accountant told me the company did. And then after I've cleaned up for r and I'll tell you what I think the company actually. Let's start with net income. The accountant told me Amgen made $4.2 billion. But once I capitalize r and remember you add back the r and expense and subtract out amortization, my net income is $5.5 billion. They were more profitable than I thought they were by looking at the accounting statements. Book value of equity jumps. Why does it jump? Because when you capitalize r and now becomes part of your balance sheet, your book value of equity goes up. My return in equity, which was 23.48%, becomes lower. It's still impressive. 17.75% is still a great return in equity, but it's not as high as I thought it was. Same phenomena apply. When I look at operating income, operating income jumps, invested capital goes up, return on capital decreases. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my valuation of Amgen with what I think are the correct numbers, which are the R&D correct numbers. What does that do? It basically gives me a return on capital that is lower than what the accountant told me, a reinvestment rate that's higher because I'm now capitalizing R&D. And the value that I got for Amgen with R&D capitalized. So you think it of the Excel spreadsheet, I've turned the, do you want to capitalize r and I've set it to yes. I've entered 10 years of R&D. The value I got was $72. $74.33. Now, one of the nice things about the spreadsheet is I can take the yes on the R&D and make it no. And what's going to happen? The whole company is going to be valued without capitalizing R&D. So I'm going to ask you a question about direction. Don't look at the next page. That would be cheating. If I don't capitalize R&D and I worked with the accounting numbers and I came up with the value per share, is that value per share going to be lower than $74.33 or higher than $74.33? Anybody want to give that a shot? You got a 50-50 shot of being right, right? You can't be awfully wrong. So what do you think is going to happen? Value goes down or up, you think? So on the one, you can already see it's on the one hand, on the other hand kind of thing, right? On the one hand, your income is going to be lower. On the other hand, your accounting returns are going to be much higher. Rather than make you, torture you by going through the, on the one hand, on the other hand, let me show you what I got. I got a value per share of $43 per share if I did not capitalize R&D. That's a big difference. At least in the case of Amgen, capitalizing R&D pushed up my value by about, what, 70%, 75%. Now, don't take this as a generalization. Don't say for every pharma company or a tech company or a platform company, capitalizing R&D is going to make me better off. Because this was true for Amgen, but I actually did this for a dozen pharmaceutical companies at the same time. For eight of those companies, you saw what happened in Amgen. The value went down. For the remaining four, the value actually went down. As an example, in the case of Merck, the value per share dropped by 
when I capitalize RD. And I think I gave you the reason for why you get different effects, right? What's the reason that somebody want to encapsulate my own argument and feed it back to me? Why am I getting an increase in value at Amgen and a decrease in value at Mark? What am I doing when I capitalize R&D? I treat it like any other investment, right? Can an investment be a good investment? Yes. Can it be a bad investment? Yes. When, with any investment, you can have good investments and bad investments. Or in capital budgeting terms, positive net present value and negative net present value. With Amgen, R&D happened to be a good investment. They spent a lot of money on R&D, but their earnings zoomed. With Merck, they spent billions of dollars in R&D and their earnings stayed flat. So when I capitalize R&D at Merck, I'm building in this bad investment to the valuation and guess what the value per share goes down. So when you capitalize R&D, that's what happens. So for those of you who capitalize R&D, just do the check, just as for curiosity, make the R&D go from yes to no, see what happens to your value per share because it's going to make a significant difference. Let's close off by talking about commodity companies. Let's say you're valuing Exxon Mobil, right? You can't get any more mature than Exxon Mobil as a commodity company, largest oil company in the world. Let's say you are valuing Exxon Mobil in April of 2020. Remember, April 2020, oil prices had collapsed, you're down to $30 a barrel. When I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? You know what the answer is going to be, right? Terrible. I'm not making much money at $30 a barrel. Nobody's making money other than Aramco. When I ask you, what's the value of growth? You look at your project and say, I wish we'd never got reserves because at this price, nothing looks good. Every investment we look at looks bad. When I ask you, how risky are you? Exxon Mobil did not have any debt, but if they had any debt, you'd worry about, hey, will I be able to make my debt payments at a $30 oil price? And if you can't make your debt payments, when will you be able to become a mature company? It becomes moot because you'll never get there. That was in April of 2020. Let's say two years later, you're looking at the same oil company. What are oil prices right now? I think this morning they were $104 a barrel. The same oil company, when I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? You're like, huge. I'm getting big earnings, positive cash flows. What's the value of growth? Everything I touch has turned to gold. How risky are you? With these cash flows, I can never go bankrupt. And when will you be a mature company? I could keep doing this for the rest of eternity, no matter what the ESG guys do. You see what I'm saying? When you're valuing a commodity company, the commodity price, even if it's a mature company, swings around and your company can go from being great to good to bad, back to being great again, entirely driven by commodity prices. So I'm going to start with a piece of advice that's going to sound incredibly contradictory given what I just said. Because what I just said was, your company is very much a function of the price of the commodity that it produces, right? So here's my advice. When you value a commodity company, try to keep your views about that commodity price out of the valuation. Let, let me repeat that again. You're valuing an oil company. Try to keep your views about oil prices out of the valuation. Sounds contradictory, but let me explain why you want to do that. Let's assume that you have a point of view on oil prices. Anybody have a strong point of view on oil prices here that you can in either direction? No? Do you have a point of view? Let's say you have a point of view on oil prices, that they're going to double. Why? Because you think that this crisis is going to spill over. Remember, Russia is the second largest oil producer in the world. You take that entirely out of the equation. You can make the argument that from this day on, that $5 gas price you're seeing at the gas station is not a temporary phenomenon, that this is going to be the norm, right? You can't replace 20% of oil production in the world without some pain. So you expect oil prices- <laughs> You guys, you got to turn off your mic. So if you believe that oil prices are going to double over the next 10 years, Let's say you build that into valuation. Tell me what's going to happen to the value that you give Exxon Mobil. We think oil prices are going to double over the next 10 years. What's going to happen to the value? It's going to be high, right? Let's say you conclude that Exxon Mobil is undervalued based on that. You ask me to buy Exxon Mobil and I ask you a question. 
I ask you whether you want me to buy Exxon Mobil because you like Exxon Mobil as a company or because you believe oil prices will double over the next 10 years. You think, why should you care? You know why I care? If it's because oil prices are going to double over the next 10 years, there's a far easier way for me to make money, right? What should I do? Go buy oil futures. If you're that good at forecasting oil prices, what the heck are you doing wasting your time valuing Exxon Mobil? Quit your day job, find your night job and your evening job or any job you have. Just buy oil futures. You could make an insane amount of money if you can get the direction right. There's a reason you want to keep your macro views. It's not because I don't allow you to have macro views, but if you bring into your valuation, you contaminate your valuation to the point that I don't know whether I can act on it. But the reality is your commodity price is, as it changes, is going to affect your value. That's kind of a gift. So the oil price goes from 105 to $60 a barrel. Exxon Mobil is going to be worth less. So anytime you value a commodity company, it's a conditional valuation. You see what I mean by conditional valuation? You say, this is my value per share given when the oil price is today. So I'm going to give you a trick that you can use to deal with that uncertainty you feel about oil prices and bring it into your valuation. So the company I'm going to value the company you should be familiar with, Royal Dutch, one of the oldest and biggest oil companies in the world. The valuation I did in March of 2016 for the Royal Dutch Finance Group in Houston. At the time that I valued the company in March of 2016, the oil price had dropped to $40 in one of its temporary collapse. And this happens, oil prices go up and down, they drop to $40. And in the 12 months leading into March of 2016, the average oil price was $65. You're saying, who cares? What do we do our valuations on based on trailing 12-month numbers, right? What have I just told you about this company? The average oil price was 65. The trailing 12-month numbers are going to reflect the price. So if I make that my base here in my valuation, you know what I'm going to find, right? The company looks cheap. It's looking cheap because I've built in a base here that reflects a different. You're actually going to run into the opposite problem when you value oil companies today because the average oil price in 2021 was $65 a barrel. You take those trailing 12 month numbers for every oil company, you put the numbers in, they'll all look expensive because you're using $65 barrel oil prices when oil prices are $104. You're saying, what choice do I have? Here's what I did. I took the Royal Dutch numbers from the last 12 months. The price was 65. I said, can I forecast out what those numbers would have looked like if the oil price had been $40 a barrel? I know the numbers would be lower, but how much lower? And here's where having a company like Royal Dutch with a long history helped me. So here's what I did. I went and collected the revenues every year from 1989 through 2015, annual revenues. I so that's a, the purple column. The brown line is the average oil price each year. Here's your question, do the two look like they move together? They look like they're in this dance kind of locked at the hip, right? In fact, if you don't believe me, you can trust this statistic. The R squared is 96.4%. But here's the bonus. If I have this data, I can take revenues, run a regression against the average oil price. And how do you read this regression? Every $1 increase in the oil price per barrel adds $4 billion to the revenues. We started this year with oil price around 70. We're now at 105. It's $35 increase in the oil price, right? You make $4 billion more per barrel. That's $140 billion more in revenues you're going to get at today's oil prices as opposed to what you saw in the trailing per month data. So the advantage of doing this now is I can go back and restate the revenues for last year saying if oil prices had been $40 a barrel, what would your, your revenues be? The rest of the valuation is pretty straightforward because once I clean up for that, I have as close as I can get to it, uh, oil price neutral valuation of Royal Dutch. What does that mean? Given where oil prices were in April of 2020, 20, uh, I'm sorry, 2016, my valuation of Royal Dutch per share would have been $39.31. Stock was actually trading at about 43. So it looks slightly overvalued. So I finished this valuation, the Royal Dutch group takes a look at it. And they ask, 
a pretty straightforward and obvious question, which is, this is based on oil prices at $40 a barrel, but we think they're going to bounce back. Why? Because oil goes up and down. I said, you're right, but I don't know where they're going to bounce to. They're going to bounce. That's the only thing I know. They can bounce down, they can bounce up. So I'm going to use something, a technique or a tool that I used earlier to deal with uncertainty. Remember when I valued the S&P 500 in November of 2020, I was uncertain about growth and earnings and payout. I did a Monte Carlo simulation. Really here, the one variable that I feel uncertain about is the oil price. Everything else about Royal Dutch, I feel pretty comfortable about. So what I did was I looked at past oil price. That's a nice thing about oil price. It's a traded investment. You can see the price. And I built a distribution of that price change. So I'm basically using oil price history to get a distribution. And I got the simulation started. So you're saying, what's happening in the simulation? The computer goes and picks a price out of the oil price distribution. Let's say the first round, it picks $55 a barrel. I get the revenues based on the 55 because I have that regression equation. I value the company the $55 price. I get a high value. Then it goes back to the distribution, picks a $34 price. I revalued at 34. And the default is the, the base default in crystal ball is 10,000 simulations. Each time it gets an oil price, it gets a different value. Here's the distribution of values for oil Dutch. You're saying, what the heck am I going to do with that? The median value is 37 which is lower than the stock price. So I can tell you the stock was overvalued, but I could have told you that without the simulation, right? The base. But here's the advantage of doing a simulation. The stock price is 43. If, I, if you ask me, is there a chance that Royal Dutch is undervalued? I can tell you what that chance is, right? I can count the number of valuations that exceed 43. And I can say 32% chance the stock is undervalued, a 68% chance it's overvalued. If you ask me what's the best I can do, I can give you best case, worst case. Every question you have, I can now answer with specifics. Think like a portfolio manager. Think of how much richer your information set is when I tell you not just the value and the price, but this distribution so you can make better decisions. So take advantage of tools and data that you have now that you didn't have then. So now I'm going to pull this process to a close and get ready to go into pricing. If you remember the first class, I talked about two processes. The first is the value process. And we've spent all of this class, 18 sessions, talking about the value process, cash flows, growth, and risk, and did the DCF dance. But I also talked about the other process, the pricing process where demand and supply drive the price. And I said early on, you got to make a decision. Are you valuing something or pricing something? Now, when you have the value process giving you a value and the pricing process giving you a price, those numbers I said can be different because demand and supply is affected by mood and momentum and other behavioral forces that can cause the price to get too high, too low. Think GameStop, think AMC, right? It's got nothing to do with value. It's got to do with demand, supply, mood, and momentum. So when you look at that difference and you say, I don't know what people are doing. Let's take a couple of examples so you can get a window into whether people are pricing or valuing things. You all look too young to own an apartment or a house. I don't mean to insult you, but one of these days, hopefully, you will buy a house or an apartment, right? So you get to that point, you go look at an apartment or a house, the realtor names a number. Let's say you come to my neighborhood. This is actually an old price. So I add an extra digit to the price. But this was from ten, eight years ago. This nice lady, Lisa Padilla, is showing you the house, 5369 La Jolla Mesa Drive. That's about two blocks from where I live. And she says, the price is 995,000. Let me ask you a question. How did Ms. Padilla put this 995,000 number on this house? Did she do a discounted cash flow? What did she do? She looked at five transactions that had happened the last two months, and she basically, that's why Zillow was able to estimate a price for every house in the country, right? If you look at Zillow, it's amazing. They say, they must have thousands of analysts sitting. No, they just took transaction prices, and they adjust for the fact that you have a bigger backyard or an extra bedroom, or that your house needs to be updated. It's pricing. There's no intrinsic valuation. Huh? You're saying those unsophisticated real estate people. Have you picked up an equity research report recently? 
Don't do it for laughs. Or maybe you should do it for laughs. If you pick up an equity research report, here's what you will see. You will see a buy or a sell or a hold on top, the analyst recommendation. But if you dig a little deeper, you're going to see a multiple price earnings, EV to EBITDA, price to book. And you'll see a bunch of companies that the analyst claims are just like your company. And here's how the story will go. So this stock is trading at one and a half times book value. These 15 other companies that are just like your company are trading at two times book value. Therefore, the stock is cheap. Buy the stock. Now, that equity research analyst is doing exactly what your realtor did, right? In fact, who do you think was on more solid ground? The realtor, when he or she claims to have found six other houses like yours in the neighborhood, or the equity research analyst valuing Microsoft, who claims to have found 15 companies just like Microsoft. I think the realtor is a much more solid ground. Equity research is, that, is just like bad real estate pricing, if you think about it. So let's, you know, let's think about the value process, the prices, pricing process. Let's think about what drives it. This should be familiar. Every company we looked at, we asked four questions, right? And value, ask questions about business. What are the cash flows? What's the value of growth? How risky are you? When will you be a mature company? You know, those things all matter in price, but if you look at what else drives price, here are the factors that drive the price of a company. The first is this kind of fuzzy mood and momentum. You think what goes into it? Everything that makes you feel shitty some days when you wake up and really good on other days. I'll give you an example. I mean, there's a study I saw a long time where it must have been researchers in playful mood. And what they looked at is what happens to the stock prices in an index of a country, which is soccer mad, the day after the country's soccer team has a serious loss in a World Cup. So let's imagine you're in Brazil, right? The whole country comes to a standstill when there's a soccer game. I still remember I was in Sao Paulo, I had to fly to Rio. I get to the airport, the flight time comes in and passes and I'm 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half. Finally, I go up to the front and say, what's going on? They said, the pilots are watching a soccer game. They won't leave till the game is done. So clearly the country revolves around soccer, which I understand. So what the study looked at is what happens the day after that country's soccer team loses in the World Cup. You know what they found? The day after a big soccer loss, stock prices are down about 2 to 3%. You think, what happened? It's not like intrinsic value change, but you all saw the game, you lost the game, you came back and you're in a terrible mood. You said, sell everything. Doesn't matter what it is. That's mood and momentum. You think, that makes no sense. It's what human beings do. The second factor is when you talk about liquidity and trading, you're talking about a pricing issue. So you're saying the float is low. You know what the float is? The, or not all shares issued by a company get traded. Some get held by the founder. They never hit the market. The float is the percentage of your shares that actually get traded. So people worry about low float. They worry about the fact there's not much trading volume. Those are pricing issues. The value of a company is not changing because you have low float or high float, but your pricing could be affected. Incremental information, small news stories. You look at it and say, really? That's why the price is off? I remember I know about eight or nine years ago, I was sitting in my office and I, I owned Apple stock then and I noticed the stock was down three and a half percent. And I checked no news stories. So I started checking to why the price is down. It turned out, that this was around an iPhone, new iPhone release. And there was a tweet from some guy who claimed to be in China. We have no. He claimed to be sitting across the street from the Apple store in Shanghai. And he said, there's nobody waiting outside the store. So this iPhone is not going to work. We have no idea whether this guy was in Shanghai, whether he was across from the store, whether he was lying. But even if he was right and there was nobody lined up, that that's a $30 billion loss in market cap based on a tweet. That's incremental information. And of course, we talked about how absurd this can get when Mr. Big or whoever falls off a bike and Peloton bike and your market cap drops 7%. That's what pricing is, though. It doesn't have to make sense because it reflects all those human emotions. 
And finally, when you think about pricing, it's about crowd. You know, we talked about lemmings. It's about what the crowd thinks. It's that old Keynesian saying that a market is like a beauty contest where your job is to not assess who the best looking person on the stage is, but to assess who the other judges think the best looking person. So you're not watching the stage, you're looking at the other judges. That's what you do in pricing. So here's the bottom line. The value process and the pricing process are driven by different forces. They can give you different numbers and we'll call that difference the gap. So let's think about it. That gap, because every investment philosophy out there can actually is, is always about the gap. If you're a believer in efficient markets, what are you telling me about the gap between value and price? There's none. You say, what gap? Or if there's a gap, it's completely random. It comes, it goes, it could be positive. It, that's basically efficient markets. So there's no gap. If you're a value extremist, you know, I call these are the people who show up in Omaha every year. They believe the whole world revolves around value. Here's what they think. They come up with the value. It's the absolute truth. Why? Because they're the chosen ones. And there's a price. Who sets the price? All these shallow people out there. So their view is the value is right. The price is wrong. And over time, what has to happen? Righteousness will prevail and price will move to value. That's the pure. And if you talk to a pure trader, his reaction is, this value stuff, you eggheads come up with the number, who cares what it is? In fact, I was on a, you know, on CNBC, after the market closes, they have, a, I think, five or six traders. It's my favorite show to be on on CNBC because these guys have no, they're, they're completely open about the fact that they think value is a complete waste of time. I'd much rather talk with them than with these portfolio managers who claim to be value investors, but have never valued a company. Their view is, who cares about value? You buy at a low price, you sell at a high price. That's a trading view of it. One of the things I tell people is make up your mind. When you enter the market, do you want to be an investor where you value things and you expect the price to move? Or do you want to be a trader? There's nothing inherently good or bad about either. They're just different ways of entering the market. Each comes with weak links. If you're a trader, here are your weakest links. First, you have no anchor. You know what I mean by an anchor? If I ask you, you know, when is a price too high? Nothing, right? So if you're buying Tesla and you're a trader, it could go 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. There's no upper limit because when you're trading, there is nothing that says you've gone too far. That's why when you look at something like Bitcoin and you say, when do I know this is too high? There is no metric because there's no anchor. And that's a dangerous place to be. Some people are okay with it. It'll freak me out. The second thing to remember about pricing is it's reactive. Why? Because you constantly have to keep your eyes on everybody else in the market. It's really not about the company anymore. It's about everybody else's behavior. And finally, you are putting your faith in crowds. And we know crowds are fickle. One of my favorite books, it's a very old book, it's 150 years old. It's called The Madness of Crowds. It's a classic. And in fact, it, it was written in the 1850s about bubbles over the pre... Remember, bubbles weren't invented in the last 20 years, the last 50 years. They've always been there. It talks about the South Sea bubble and the tulip price bubble. And as you read it, you're going to get a sense of deja vu because as you read about what people did in the 1600s and the 1800s, you realize we're still doing the same thing. We're just doing them even more in mass than we used to because we now have social media, our crowds now can be huge and we're doing exactly the same thing. So that's the pricing problem. What about value people? Don't get too comfortable if you're a value investor saying, thank God I'm not a trader. You have your own issues. Here are the two fundamental issues. Each of you has valued a company or pretty close to valuing a company. You got a price. There is a gap, right? For some of you, the gap is positive, some it's negative. But if I asked you, are you sure about the gap? The answer is not really, because your value is an estimate. It could be wrong. So you're saying, I think my stock is undervalued, but I don't know for sure. So there's uncertainty about how much the gap is and even which direction. The second is, even if you feel pretty comfortable about the gap, for you to make money, what has to happen? The gap has to close. You're saying, how is that going to happen? That's not in your control. You're uncertain about your value. You're uncertain about the gap closing, which means it's hubris to put all your money on one stock. 
and say, let me write this one stop. It's my argument for diversifying is not because I don't have conviction, but I don't have enough conviction to put all my money in one stop. So this gap is at the heart of all investment philosophies. And as a value investor, you have to make, you make money when the gap closes, not because there's a gap, but the gap closes. And I'll tell you, one of the things we've not researched or talked about enough in investing, there's a lot of books on how do you know whether there's a gap? Now, how do you value companies? But there are very few books on what causes the gap to close. So let's talk a little bit about you're an investor, you've invested because there's a gap between the price and the value. What, you can, what your attitude can be about the gap. The first is to take the karmic view, which is you've done your valuation, you did the best you could, you come up with the value, there's a price out there. You say, look, it's not in my control, I'm gonna go back and live through it. It's a very healthy attitude, but it basically means you're saying, I don't control the gap closing. I'm gonna invest and let time be my ally. Hoping. But many people want to do something more. So I'll give you a couple of things you could do. If you're Carl I can and you find a gap and you buy the shares, you don't sit there, take the karmic view saying, I'll wait and see if something good happens. You get on CNBC, you try to you know, be as loud as you can, hoping to be the catalyst. The key word is catalyst to make the gap close. But you and I, maybe I should just talk about myself. Maybe you're wealthy enough to be a Carl I can, I'm not. So I'm not going to make the gap close. So I've got to figure out other things. And I make a couple of suggestions. Catalysts for price for gaps closing usually come from people taking a second look at a company. One of the reasons I think these, you know how people get all excited when the value of a company exceeds a trillion, two trillion. You know, from an intrinsic value standpoint, you say, who cares? But actually, as you move through these periods, it gives people a chance to look at your company again. In good ways or bad ways, it leads to reassessment. When a new CEO comes in, makes people take another look. A lot of people are taking a look at Twitter again. Why? Because Elon Musk has taken a 9.2. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that first board meeting, wouldn't you? I would love to be sitting there in Elon Musk. Because remember, you know, when Steve Jobs became a director at Apple, one of the things I would say is it's good to have a shit disturber in the room when you're a business that's set in your ways. And I think that this is, it's, if nothing else, I'm not saying any suggestions he makes are gonna be good suggestions, but they will shake up the company, reassessment. So as a final example here, I, you know, I valued Apple pretty much every year going back in time. And this table, I actually have my estimate of value per share every September from 2011, I actually have it all the way through 2022 now but through 2019, there's my value per share, there's the price. Does my value change? Absolutely. I have never felt defensive about value change. Why does the value change? Because earnings change, cash flows change, growth rates change. Does the price change? Absolutely too. Remember there are two things in motion here. People often act like the price is changing and the value is staying constant. Value is changing, price is changing. And the bottom line here is you had a company that's been undervalued four times in the last 10 years, overvalued four times and pretty much fairly valued twice. You know how that plays out in your actions, right? I, bu I bought Apple when I felt it was undervalued, sold it when it was overvalued because again, this is this dance you're doing between the gap becoming positive and negative. So when you value a company and you come to a conclusion on May 9th and you tell me this stock is overvalued, I'm not buying it. Come back to it again and again. Because what's overvalued today could become undervalued six months from now or a year from now. So I'm going to close this intrinsic value section with a picture from one of my favorite movies. Do you recognize the movie? It's The Wizard of Oz. Now you've, you've, how many of you have never seen The Wizard of Oz? You should. This is something everybody's got to experience at least once. I'll, I'll give you the compressed story. And don't jump down my throat saying that story is unrealistic. I didn't write the story. It's about this girl called Dorothy who lives in Kansas. She gets sucked up by a tornado. Already saying that is so unrealistic. Hang in there. She gets sucked up by a tornado. And the tornado takes her and drops her in this mythical land of Oz. And she lands on top of a witch. I always forget which of the West, which of the East. And she kills the witch. 
So she's facing homicide charges now. And she wants to go back. This all happens in the first five minutes of the movie. So if you're taking your kids, skip the first five minutes. It's really traumatic. So the witch is dead. And Dorothy wants to go home. So she turns this munchkin. And that's the best way I can describe this creature, this tiny creature by the side of the road. And she says, I need to go back to Kansas. Which way do I go? And he says, I have no idea. Go, go talk to the Wizard of Oz. He has the answer to everything. And she says, how do I get to the Wizard of Oz? She says, follow the yellow brick road. This is all, you know, so around the six minutes, a yellow brick road magically pops up and Dorothy for the next three hours hops and skips and jumps down the yellow brick. She never walks. If you don't believe me, watch the movie. And along the way, she collects a motley crew, a lion that needs courage, a tin man that needs it. So basically each one, and each is told, go see the Wizard of Oz. He has the answer. So two hours and 55 minutes later, it's a really long movie, they arrive at the wizard's chambers. They go in and he's behind a curtain, which should already be a red flag. Why are you hiding behind a curtain? And they each say, this is what I want. The wizard listens and he says, come back tomorrow. This is like a government office, come back tomorrow. So I keep two hours and 55 minutes hopping down a yellow brick road to get here. You ask me to come back tomorrow. At that time, the curtain falls and they discover that there's this little guy in the back. There's no wizard. He's pulling these things to make it look like this. There's a point to the story. What happened is during the course of the journey, each of them got what they wanted. Dorothy got these magical red shoes, which if she clicked, she was back in Kansas again. The cowardly lion fought off some bad guys along the way, acquired courage. And the point of the entire movie is everything you want is on the journey. Let me bring this down to valuation. Valuation, there are all these questions you come up with, right? What tax rate should I use? Effective or marginal? What happens if my effective tax rate is negative? And we live in a world where the answer is always one website away, right? What do you, when you have a question, what do you do? You go into Google search and say, what tax rate should I use? It's like the Wizard of Oz out there. And you get this magical answer, use the effective tax rate. Maybe it should speak in a wizard's voice. It's a terrible way to deal with questions because if you think about the answers to these questions, they're embedded in the practice. If you think about why are we taking taxes out, already by asking that question, you can say, hey, what's the right tax rate to use to get a reasonable value? What I'm trying to say is there will be questions after leave this class which sound like mechanical questions. You're always welcome to email me and say, what should I use? But I think that's not healthy. I want you to think through the process of valuation to come up with your own answers. Because you have, you, you're have you going to go back to exactly what I, you know, if you ask me the question, that is what I would do is I'd go back to base. Now, how would I answer the question? You already have the tools to be able to answer. it. You don't need a Wizard of Oz in valuation. So let's turn to packet two. If you didn't print it off, don't worry. You can print it off for the next class. So. So if you have packet two grade, if not, not a big deal. So let's turn to pricing. Let me start off by stating the essence of pricing. In pricing, here's what you're trying to do. You're trying to put a number on an asset based on how similar assets are being priced out there. And if you think about what that in involves, there are three components to doing pricing. First, to price something, you need to be able to find other things just like your thing that's, that have been bought or sold by other people. I mean, I, I was planning to buy tickets to the Yankee game tomorrow, but I, it's washed out already. Opening day is now Friday. And I'm actually going to be in California by then. So I went, wanted to buy tickets for the 12th, which is next Tuesday. So I went on SeatGeek. Have you ever gone on SeatGeek? SeatGeek is this great, it's an aggregator. You use StubHub. Basically, it's all these, these sec, you know, secondhand sellers in one place. I looked for a seat and it gave me a price for the seat. And then it told me whether this is a great deal, a good deal, or a bad deal. It's amazing, right? You know how they come up with that? They look at the section you're looking at. They look at the price being asked for the seat. They compare it to the prices that other people are asking in the same area. And they send section 126, there are seven seats for sale. The prices range from 120 to 183. The seat you're looking at is at 120. It is a great deal. That's pricing. 
And if you break it down, there are three components of pricing. First, you've got to find those comparable with, with Yankee seats. It becomes very simple. Take the section, look for other seats. With real estate, it gets a little messier finding other houses like yours. With stocks, it gets really, it gets really messy finding other companies like yours. Second step is I can't compare price per share across companies. You're saying you did it for seats. I do because each seat, each price gets me one seat. You know, the problem with comparing price per share across uh, prices per share across companies is if I base cheap or expensive based on the level of the price, what's the most expensive stock in the US? Berkshire Hathaway, because it's what, six digits, 300 and something thousand dollars. And what's the cheapest stock? Every penny stock trades at a penny, right? If you're making a serious mistake, is that penny stocks are cheap. I'm going to pour all my money in penny stocks. That's why we scale price to something. That's what a pricing multiple is, right? Price to earnings, price to book, EV to sales. We'll talk about the process of standardizing prices. In real estate, you know how this plays out? You have a 10-story building with a, next to a 50-story building. I can't compare the prices of these buildings, but I can compare the price per square foot. It's a standardized price. And the third step, if I'm careful, I have to control for differences. The building is newer, it's more updated, the price per square foot should be higher. Comparables, standardized price, a story to explain or not explain the difference. So I'm gonna start with a statement and I'll back it up. Much of what passes for valuation out there in investment banks and consulting firms and appraisal places is really pricey. Let me back that up. About uh, 20 years ago, I collected 550 equity research reports from around the world. I would read most of them, I'll make that confession. I collected them because I wanted to see how equity research analysts put a number on a company. Out of the 550 equity research reports, 45 were intrinsic valuation, less than 10%. 450 were pricing and comparables. 10 to one, pricing outnumbered valuation. You say, what about the other 55? I couldn't even categorize them. A mystical search for self and all kinds of things equity research analysts were doing. But among the ones I could categorize, 10 to one in equity research, pricing up number valuation. I said, maybe it's different in corporate finance. So I went and found a hundred acquisition valuations. And at first sight, it looked like a more even breakdown, 50-50, half were discounted cash flow value. But then I took a closer look at the discounted cash flow valuations and I realized they weren't really intrinsic valuations. You know why? Because the terminal value came from using a multiple as a forward pricing. So the reality is there's no dancing around this. Most people, when they put numbers on companies, price them, they don't value them. And that initially puzzled me a little bit, and here's why. At the end of each of my classes, going back 35 years, I ask an exit question. I will do that when you get to session 28 of this class. After you've done your discounted cash flow valuation of your company and you attach a pricing to your company, I'm going to ask you, now that you've tried your hand at both, which number do you trust more? Which one would you put your hat on? Which, which approach would you hang your hat on? And in the 35 years that I've asked this question, the answer is pretty much always broken down. 70, 20, 10. 70% of people when they leave my class say, they're going to do intrinsic valuation. They like it because it forces you to understand the business more, probably reflecting my biases. About 20% say, well, I've tried both and I like this pricing approach, much better, much cleaner. I don't like to make those assumptions explicitly. And about 10% become believers in efficient markets after they value one company because they realize this wasn't as easy as they thought it was. Maybe the market's not stupid. I wager if I track these people down five years later, whatever job they have and say, hey, remember you left my classroom saying you believe in intrinsic valuation? What are you using right now? I'll wager the numbers get flipped. That five years out, 70% of the people are using pricing and 20% are doing intrinsic valuation. So I've, I've struggled with this. What is it about the real world that's going to make even those of you truly believe in intrinsic valuation switch to pricing? And I've come up with three answers. The first came to me while I was watching a Seinfeld episode. You've seen Seinfeld, right? It's quintessential New York sitcom. And in this episode, one of, one of Jerry's girlfriends accuses him of being crazy. He said, Jerry, you're crazy. And he says, if you think I'm crazy, you should see the guy who looks across the hall from me. 
Remember who lived across the hall from Jerry? It's a guy called Kramer. If you've never watched the Seinfeld, this will mean nothing to you. Relative to Kramer, who's crazy, right? That guy makes everybody look sane. You think, what's this got to do with valuation? We forget how much a valuation is selling. You're trying to sell things. It's easy to sell something based on a price. Because all you have to do is find something even more overpriced. You're asking 30 times revenues for your cloud company? Say, so that's a bargain. 30 times revenue is a bargain? Well, everything else is trading at 50 times revenues. You pick the right comparables. You can pretty much sell me anything or buy anything off me. Pricing is easy to sell. Pricing is also easier to defend. When you showed me your DCF, I could pick it apart, right? Yo, what do you use that bait? I didn't go there, but I could have said, your debt ratio looks off. You know, why do you assume this? Everything you do is out there for people to pick apart. In contrast, if you said, I'm going to use three times revenues because that's what other companies in the sector traded. Think of the target you've given me. You say, you don't like three times revenues? Take it up with the market. That's basically what we're doing in pricing. It's not my fault. I'm just the messenger. And there's a final reason why I think pricing ends up dominating, and it's very cynical. I'm a believer in intrinsic valuation, but I'm a realist. I think if I do intrinsic value right, I'm going to be right maybe 56 times out of 100, 57. Remember, random is 50 50. I'm beating that 57, but I'm going to be wrong 43 times out of 100. If I do pricing, even if I do it well, I think I'll be right 51 times out of 100. 57 beats 51, right? You're saying, I'll go with intrinsic valuation. Here's the catch. When you're wrong with intrinsic valuation, you're far more likely to be wrong alone. Think of what? With intrinsic valuation, you're often buying when other people are selling. You're a contrarian. You're selling when other people are buying. You're a contrarian. When you're right, you're celebrate. But when you're wrong, guess what happens to people who are wrong alone? They get fired. It's a survival mechanism. Pricing, you always have the defense of, don't blame me. Everybody was doing it with intrinsic valuation, you don't. So that lead in, let's talk about even if you're a true believer in intrinsic valuation, why I think you need to at least understand pricing. I told you I'm a believer in intrinsic value, but I'm intensely curious about the pricing process. Part of the reason is the way we're judged is often against the pricing game. As a portfolio manager, Nobody celebrates you for making 15% returns. Everybody else is making 25%. You almost are under the market obligation to realize, hey, that's what the market is doing. And even if you don't have that worry, I don't have that worry. How do I make money? I make money from the price moving towards value. Understanding the pricing process might make me a better investor because it makes me time my investment better. So I'm saying, don't fall into camps. I often find people saying, I'm an intrinsic value person. I don't do pricing. Or I hear people say, I use only pricing. I don't do intrinsic valuation. Understanding how to do pricing is critical, even if you never use pricing. So with that lead in, let's talk a little bit about the process of pricing. Remember I said, to do pricing, you need to standardize the price. Let's think about how you go about standardizing the price. This is kind of a general approach, to, you know, way of thinking about, hey, how do we come up with the multiple? In the numerator, you always have some market number. Let's, get, let's look at the choices. You can look at the market capitalization, market value of equity. You can take the market value of equity plus the market value of debt. That's the total value of the firm. Or you can take the market value of equity plus debt minus cash, it's called enterprise value. All three are measures of market value. That's the numerator, always a market value. But I can scale it to lots of different things. I can scale market value to revenues. Why would I do that? Desperation. If you have a money losing company, everything is negative. I keep climbing or oh, revenues. So when you see revenue multiples, it will usually be in sectors where the earnings are negative or very small. But what if you have a pre-revenue company? A lot of young startups don't even have revenues. And I'm truly desperate, right? Then I look for things that might give me revenues. Like what? Oh, you have a lot of subscribers? One of these days you'll figure out how to make money. So I'm going to divide market value by subscribers, market value per downloads, market value per user. Those are revenue multiples. If you get to be a more mature company of earnings, I can scale to earnings. It can be earnings to equity investors, net income earnings per share. 
or it can be earnings to all investors operating in gold. I can scale to cash flows. If I want to get really fancy, I can scale to free cash flowed equity. We spend a lot of time estimating that. But if I want a shortcut, I can take net income add depreciation and kind of stop there. This is not a DCF. I don't have to get perfect. If I'm looking at operating income, I can add back depreciation amortization. I get EBITDA. I can scale to cash flows. Or I can scale to book value. What is book value? That's what the accountant thinks my company is worth. I can say, what's the market thing? I can look at book value of equity or book value of equity plus debt. That's the total book value of the company or book value of equity plus debt minus cash. That's an invested capital that we did sales to capital and return on capital. The numerator is always a market value. The denominator is a scalar that tries to make companies comparable. So with that lead in, I'm going to give you a four-step process that if you're religious about, will make you a better price. Because when I first started teaching valuation, I used to try to convince people not to do price. I don't do that anymore because many of you, no matter what you think, will end up in jobs where your ultimate job is to price things. And I want you to be able to do it better. So here's the four-step process. I'm going to start by defining the multiple. Now, you might be, feel mildly insulted when I say that because your reaction is, I know what a PE ratio is. Do you? When you say PE and I say PE, do, are we talking about the same thing? So I'm going to take the, the multiple and take it through a couple of definition tests. Then I'm going to do what I'm going to call my descriptional test. You guys seen Moneyball? Remember the Jonah Hill character in Moneyball? I want you to think like Jonah Hill when you look at number, because we're surrounded in investing with all these traditions, things that have been carried through, just like those old scouts. And much of it is crap. And we now have the data to contest it. That's what the description was. Look at the data, look at all of it, make judgments based on all of the data. Define, describe. Third step, I'm going to draw on my understanding of discounted cash flow valuation and tell you what the variables are that drive the multiple you pick. So if you pick EV to sales, I said, these are the four variables you should be controlling for. PE ratios, these are the three variables. It's like magic, but after I show you how to do it, it's very simple and you can do it yourself for any multiple. Define, describe, analyze, and only then do I want to apply. One of the problems with pricing is people are lazy. They want to get to step four without doing steps one through three. But steps one through three are critical in using pricing right. So let's take the first step, the definitional test. There are two basic questions you have to ask whenever you see a multiple. Is this multiple consistently defined? And let me explain. Remember I said the numerator is a market value? Here's the consistency rule. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator has to be an equity value too. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator has to be a firm or an Sounds like I'm talking Greek, right? Let's take a few multiples so you can see this play out. Price earnings ratio. What's in the numerator? Equity value, firm value, enterprise value. When you see a price earnings ratio, it's an equity value, price per share, market cap. And denominator is earnings per share, which is net income divided by share count, which is an equity value. Thank God for small blessings. The most widely used multiple in the world is okay. PE ratio is okay. Take EV to EBITDA. What's in the numerator? Market value equity plus debt minus cash. It's a market value operating assets of the company, right? What's in the denominator? Earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization, a rough measure of operating cash flow. EV debit is okay. You think what wouldn't be okay? Let me take you back to those 550 equity research reports I read through. Nine of them used price to EBITDA as their pricing metric. One of them happened to be somebody had gone through this class. I recognized the name from about a decade ago. He didn't, his grade was not that good. I went and checked the grade. So it kind of set the stage for what I was going to call him about. I said, you know, I looked at your report and you're using price to have it done. I said, this is not consistent. Numerator is an equity value. Denominator is to the entire company. You know what his response was? I'm being consistent. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I use price to have it done for all 15 companies in my sector. I said, that's a very strange definition of consistency. I said, have you been noticing that companies with a lot of debt keep looking cheap to you? He said, yes, yes, I've been noticing that. I said, have you ever thought, stopped and thought about why that might be happening? 
You see why when you use price to EBITDA, companies with a lot of debt are always going to, let's take, let's take an example. Let's say you have a company, which is all equity funded. It decides to do a major buyback using debt. In other words, it goes out and borrows $600 million, buys back shares. What happens the day after? The share count drops, the market cap gets smaller because the equity is shrunk. The EBITDA is unaffected by the fact that you borrowed because you could borrow till the cows come home and it's earnings before interest. So the more you borrow, the cheaper you will look. Before you get, feel too superior to this guy, anytime you use a price to sales ratio, an amazing number of analysts use it, you're committing the same sin, right? The reason they get away with it is pure accident. This, what sector do you see price to sales ratios used by analysts the most? Tech companies usually. And you know what bails them out? Tech companies don't have a lot of debt. It's purely accidental. Consistency. Second stop, make sure it's uniformly estimated. You see why this is critical? Because you're going to compare this across 15 companies, the PE ratio, the earnings per share better be estimated exactly the same way. We used to think that if you had the same accounting standards, GAP, IFRS, this would happen. But in the last 20 years, you know what we've learned? You can have the same accounting standards and different degrees of fidelity to those standards. You don't even have to break the rules. You just use the discretion. And if you are an aggressive company, you would report higher earnings than a conservative company. And if you're not careful, aggressive companies will start to look cheap because they're using the discretion. So let's take the PE ratio and let's ask a few questions to kind of make clear this consistency issue. Everybody knows what the PE ratio is, right? It's price to buy earnings per share. You, know, you, you go on Reddit and you talk about people who started investing yesterday, they ask you like, what's a PE, what's a PE ratio for this company? Even Anna Kornikova seemed to know what the PE ratio was. You guys remember Anna Kornikova? She masqueraded as a Russian tennis player for like a decade. Didn't win a thing, but it was in every commercial you could think of. This was actually in, I think, 2000. It was a Schwab commercial. And Anna Kornikova was playing, must have been an actress. She was actually winning. So you know how in tennis, every two games, you, you switch sides to make sure the sun is not in your eye. So this is the middle of a match, middle of a tennis match. I don't know why this would come up. Anna turns to this actress and says, price earnings ratio is price divided by earnings per share. And then he started talking about preferred dividends. It went completely over my head. So I turned off the TV, almost canceled my Schwab account right away. Then I started thinking, does Anna Kornikova really know what the price earnings ratio is? I mean, the numerator is usually the current price, right? Unless you've got one of those technical analysts gone crazy, you like use moving averages for everything. If you ever run into one of these people, ask them a question. Have you ever tried buying a stock at a moving average price? It's really, really tough to do. In the denominator, though, is where you get the differences. I can divide price per share by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year, which early this year would have been 2020, right? Because this 2021 numbers didn't come out in March or April. I could divide price per share by earnings per share in the last 12 months, trailing 12 months, it's called trailing PE. I could divide price per share by expected earnings per share in the next 12 months, it's called forward PE. And in a really, really confusing turn of events, I can divide price per share today by earnings per share in the year 2030, which would be really, really, really forward PE. You think, why would I do that? Desperation again. You're the biotech analyst. You have 20 companies in your sector. They're all losing money. And the only tool you have is PE ratios. You're kind of stuck, right? So you know what you do? You project out the earnings for each company 10 years forward. And you tell me a company looks cheap because it's trading at eight times 20, 30 months. In fact, if I were making the Schwab commercial, I'd have made the actress turn to Anna and say, trailing earnings or forward earnings, Anna? Because then we would have really found out whether Anna Kornikova really knows what the PE ratio is. But let's dig a little deeper into PE ratios on consistency because there are sub layers of consistency. Here's the first challenge. Let's say you are the technology analyst. You've got 25 companies in your sector. Some of these companies have no options outstanding. Remember we talked about employee options and some of a lot of employee options outstanding. Getting a per share number becomes a little dicey here, right? So I'll give you the choices. And with each one, I'd like you to tell me the kind of skew or bias it's going to create if I use that multiple. I can divide price by just actual shares outstanding. If I do that, 
which of these companies in the sector are going to look cheap to me? The companies with lots of options or no options? Lots of options and tell me why. What's going to happen when you have lots of options? The market knows you have lots of options. The market price drops, I mean, market cap drops. And because I'm dividing by just the number of shares outstanding, you're going to look insanely cheap to me. Not because you're cheap, but because I'm missing the options. If I go to the other extreme and divide price by diluted earnings per share, where I count all options as if they're outstanding, I'm going to go in the other direction. I'm going to find any company that doesn't have options outstanding looks cheap to me. And again, for the wrong reasons. Some people use only in the money option. Really, there's no per share calculation that's going to give you an N number that makes sense. You're saying, what would I do? What do you need? A ratio, right? I can get there by taking price per share and dividing by earnings per share. But I could also get there by taking market cap, which is the total value of equity, and dividing my net income. If you have this issue with share count, it's best to do things on an aggregated basis. In fact, if you wanted to do it right, you'd actually have to value. Remember how we valued options in the DCF approach? You should value the options, add them to the market cap. That might be overkill, but if nothing else, be very careful of per share numbers with companies with lots of options outstanding. Move on to EB2 EBITDA. When I first uh, entered markets, probably out of every 50 equity research reports, one would use EB2 EBITDA, the early 80s. In the mid 80s, you start to see EB2 EBITDA get used more, and we'll come back and talk about what might have driven that. But today, about a third of equity research uses EV to EBITDA. So here's EV. Numerator is market value of equity plus debt minus cash. Denominator is EBITDA. So when I run into an analyst who uses EV to EBITDA, and quite a few, I ask them a question. Maybe one of you can give me the right answer because they never seem to have the right answer. So why do we net cash out of the numerator? You see my question? Why do we just say equity plus debt? Why do we net cash out of the numerator when we do EV to EBITDA. Anybody have an answer to that? Why do we net cash out? It's a consistency reason. Yep. Exactly. EBITDA doesn't include the interest income from cash. So leaving it in the numerator is a little unfair, right? Because I'm asked. And in fact, we just opened the door. If I follow that rule, what else should I be netting out of the numerator? in addition to cash. When we did our valuations, what was the other item that doesn't show up as part of operating income that we had to clean up for after the valuation? Cross holdings, right? If you have cross holdings in other companies, you need to net that out as well. You see why it's a nightmare computing EV to EBITDA for a company with lots of cross holdings? I've heard people say, when I do that cross holdings part in DCF valuation, they said, this is such a nightmare. Thank God I don't have to deal with it. I use an EV to EBITDA. Really? You thought you were escaping a real problem by using a multiple? So when you have minority holdings and majority holdings, computing the EV to EBITDA can be really an issue. Forget about using it. Let's do one final example on consistency before we leave, leave this process. A couple of weeks ago, I got an email from somebody who's a housing expert. And his concern was he thinks there's a bubble in housing. And he actually used a metric that a lot of housing people look at to see if housing. He took the price of a house, what do you have to pay to buy a house, and divided by what it would cost you to rent the same house. It's like a ratio. The higher this ratio becomes, the more you're paying for the house relative to the rent limit. Let's say you take that multiple of price of the house to, rent, to what you could rent that house for. And you're trying to decide whether to put your money in stocks or real estate. So my question is a very simple comparison question. If that is the multiple I'm using to gauge how much housing is priced at, what's the analogous multiple I should be looking at when I'm looking at stocks? So let me give you the first choice. Can I compare that to P ratios? And if not, why not? I'm taking the price of the house dividing by total rental income. What do I do with PE ratios? I take the market cap of equity and divide by net income. You see the inconsistency at the housing price you get from both equity and debt. So it's basically more like an enterprise value, right? And if you think about what's in the denominator, it's not net income. It's really like EBITDA because it's earnings before it's, it's 
because from this you can subtract out depreciation, you may pay interest. So if I wanted to really compare how housing is priced versus stocks, I should be comparing housing prices to rental. And it's actually, it's a very interesting statistic. You can actually find out what it is in different parts of the country compared to the EV debit. This consistency point comes back over and over again in, in pricing. And I want you to get comfortable with it. Which brings me to my money ball section of pricing. And I used, I introduced Jonah Hill for a reason. So if you get a chance, watch Moneyball sometime this weekend, right? It's fun to watch. You know? And get the message, right? Basically, the message in Moneyball is there's a lot of old tradition in baseball, and the same thing as investing. A lot of these rules that come out of nowhere that people follow, and 30 or 40 years ago, we had no choice, right? We couldn't contest it. Now we have the data. And that's what we're going to do with pricing. We're going to start by looking at the data and we're going to ask the standard statistical question. What's the mean? What's the median? What's the standard deviation? But don't stop there. Look, take a look at the actual distribution. And I'm going to show you the distribution and start asking questions. Now, this is going to sound abstract if I just stay here. So I'm going to take what I do at the start of every year. At the start of every year, I compute every conceivable multiple for every publicly traded stock in the world. It sounds like a lot of work, right? But it's really six extra columns in Excel and computing the PE ratio price to book EV debit. So I have 46,000 publicly traded companies of the PE ratios, the price to book ratios, EV debit. This is just a US subset of my sample. I do a histogram. Remember histograms from statistics basically count the number of companies with PE ratio zero to four, four to eight, eight to 12. So nothing, you know, it's not rocket science. And I draw the histogram. When you take a look at that, so that it's current P, trailing P, and forward P. So here's my first question. When you look at the histogram, notice it doesn't look like that distribution we all love, the one that we get attached to in statistics. You know what I'm talking about? A P ratio can never, ever, ever be normally distributed. Why not? What's the, what's the end game in a normal, if it's a true normal distribution, what are the limits on a normal distribution? What does it run from? Minus infinity to plus infinity, right? The tails are really slim, there's very little chance of getting there. What's the lowest value of PE ratio can take? Zero, you can't go below zero. You can't have a negative PE ratio. What's the highest value? God only knows. So you've got what's called the skewed distribution where the tail is on one side. You say, who cares? This is inside statistics. You should care. And here's what. I computed the standard statistics for current trailing and forward piece. So what you have here is, this is actually a typo. The median should be 16.91. So cross out the 13.09, put 16.91 there. I've computed all this. So let's start at the top. There are 7,229 companies in my US sample, but only 2,592 in my PE distribution. What happened to the other 4,700? Yeah. So you All of them are negative earnings. That's amazing. I've lost two thirds of my sample right at the start, right? That's always been the case with PE ratios. I lose 40, 60, 55, 65% of my sample. Is that a problem? Why some of you saying, who cares? I still have 2,600 companies. It's a big sample. But remember in sample in statistics, we talk about sampling bias. Have I created some sampling bias by just this very first step? Absolutely, I've thrown out the youngest, the riskiest, the most negative earning companies. Already there's a skew in my sample. You say, why is that number getting, you no? Know, as, as you go through changing? Because with trailing earnings, you can get a few, I mean, in this case, because you went from 2020 to trailing 12 months, so there's a little improvement, more companies at positive earnings. But then you get to forward earnings, it drops off again. You know what? To do a forward P, what do I need? I need an expected earnings per share next year, which means if your company is not tracked by analysts, I lose you again. We create bias in the most subtle ways. And even the multiple we pay. The average P for a US company was 91. That should freak you out, right? I mean, nowhere have you ever read P rate, but that's what the simple average was. You know why it was so high? Because this is one company hanging out here with a PE ratio of 37,557. 
you think that must be one highly priced company. I think the price was actually $8.22 per share. But the earnings per share was a fraction of a cent. It's just pure math. It happens every single year. You think, what do I do? Well, there's a very simple solution. I remember my, my, my statistics professor saying, when you have an asymmetric distribution, I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. He said, don't trust the average. In simple language, you know what he was saying, right? If you have a skewed distribution, the outliers are all on one side of the distribution, the average is going to get screwed up. Use the median. The median PE was 16.91. That's a number I screwed up. Much, much lower than the 90.90 that you see up. The statistics already start to give you red flags on B. You know how many times I hear equity research analysts say, well, this company is cheap. It's trading at less than the average P for the market. And my response is, what's the median? So let me do one final graph and we'll end for the day. Until 2002, I used to do just US companies because my raw data was only US companies. And every time I'd go to an emerging market, Sao Paulo, Mumbai, some old analyst would put up his hand and say, that's true in the US, but it's not true here. He said, how do you know? It's a gut feeling, which is absolute nonsense. Nobody has gut feelings about distributions. The nice thing now is I have the data across all markets. This is the histogram across all companies around the world broken down by region. It's the first thing that jumps out when you look at those distributions, they all look alike, right? Peak to the left, tail to the right. It is true the median values vary across the markets. And I'm gonna leave you with one final point. If I just pick the lowest P region of the world and said, that region looks really cheap. At the start of 2022, where would all my money have been invested? Well, let's go down. Oh, the cheapest market in the world was Eastern Europe and Russia. God help you if you put all your money in Russia, that should be where we start off next session is, you can't just go where the PE ratio is the lowest because there can be really good reasons for differences in PE ratios across companies. So I will see you on Monday. And if you haven't turned in your DCF, the window is still open, please send it in. I'll send it back to you as soon as I can. Yep. Hang on, you had a question. So, so you weren't able to join the Zoom link? Yeah.